Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Unqualified with your host, Anna Ferris. Are you in Los Angeles right now? I am in Los Angeles, yes. How do you like Los Angeles? I like Los Angeles a lot because there's a lot of options to do things. Because I grew up in a really, really small town in Ohio of like 10,000 people. So it's just flat land and farming community. And the closest big town is about an hour and 15 minutes away. So the option to actually like do anything is nice. Do you go back home ever? I usually go back twice a year, usually sometime in the summer. And then once during like Christmas time, just to see friends and some of the family that's still there. On a scale of one to 10, How much do you look forward to a return? I love going back to see the friends that I still have there. My uh, two or three friends I still have there have actually been my friends since kindergarten. And it's kind of nice because we don't talk while I'm gone whatsoever. But I get back and it takes like 20 minutes to say my stuff, 20 minutes to say their stuff. And then we kind of just hang out and don't talk about anything all night. So it's kind, of, it's kind of nice that it's just so laid back and you get out of the craziness sometimes. Uh, so I, I mean, I'd probably say an eight. I grew up in a town called Edmonds, Washington, which mm-hmm. is north of Seattle. It's not a small town. It's like a suburb of Seattle. But I did find like going back over the years, we have the nostalgia in our memories. But, you know, like the older you get, sometimes you have less and less in common. And it's nice to have that with some friends, even though we have wildly different lives. It just doesn't matter. Yeah, because that's the thing is like my one friend is is still never been on a plane, <laughs> you know, which is absolutely insane to me because, you know, you do it constantly. You're flying here, there, working. You're jumping on a plane every few days sometimes because you, it, you have to be there. And yes, we don't have much in common. And I think that's probably why it's nice because at the same time, though, because they enjoy their lives there and that's where they want to be the rest of their lives. And that's great. Um, But that's, I guess, why most of the night is just filled with telling jokes or just, it's not trying to connect on a deeper level, but it's just having fun. But there is a disconnect because that's all they really know. My options growing up before I got into acting were either become like a nurse, an accountant, an engineer. That's kind of it, you know? When you were a kid, would you have described yourself as somebody who like kind of always wanted their world to be bigger? Yeah, 100%. Because I grew up with mostly women in my life. All my cousins were women and they danced. I heard about this tap dancing. Will you tell me all about it? (laughs) Yes, I will. So I'm the only child. So my cousins to me were like siblings. They're all older than me. So I looked up to them. And obviously, when you have like siblings, older siblings, you want to do what they do. And obviously coming from a small town where it's, uh, you know, Midwest, it's all sports. If you're a guy, you're a manly man, it's that whole thing. But that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to perform and I was different. I was the only and first boy to dance in our town for years. I love tap dancing. I took like a few classes when I was a kid and I'm wildly uncoordinated, (laughs) but I love it. I mean, you're making music with your feet. It's fucking rad. Would you perform in your community? Yeah, so there was Center Stage Dance Academy. Jill Kuman was my dance teacher. She uh, taught everybody. But obviously, I, I danced with girls all the time because there was no other there was no other guy. But I got into it, and then I actually got into competitive dance. That's what I would do. I would I would travel around Ohio and go to dance competitions. I'd have my solo piece, and then I would have a dance with the girls. Did you win a lot? When I danced with the girls, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, I would. Well, I mean, you're thinking Midwest Ohio. Like I said, not many boys dance. So when the judges saw it, they were like, there's a boy dancing, and it's cute. So I won quite a bit. I would basically have rehearsal every day after school. That probably helped, too. Okay, what qualities do you think you inherited from your parents? It's interesting because my dad is uh, hard labor. 
he owns his own business. He installs heavy machinery and car manufacturers, and that's basically what he's done his entire life. His family is very musically inclined, so I think I kind of get some of that from his side. My mom danced as well when she was younger, but they both don't like the camera. No one likes to be at the center of attention. So I don't quite know where I got it from. It's interesting. They're both extremely hardworking and driven, also very confident. So I feel like I got a lot of that from them because I have goals and I don't have an option not to reach my goals. If I set a goal, I'm going to reach it no matter what. doesn't matter what it is. I'm going to do it. And they're very driven like that, which is a very, it's very good, but it can be bad sometimes because, you know, you would get frustrated with yourself if you don't get something fast enough or anything like that. What about a goal like running a marathon or climbing Mount Everest? I don't have any goal to do that. I like that, Tanner. (laughs) That was a litmus test question for me, only because I'm not quite like that. And I also, some goals I do wonder about if people are achieving them for a story, for a bragging right. Yeah, I mean, I know it exists for sure. Okay, Tanner, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? I really like to just be left alone. Like this quarantine has been great because I didn't go stir crazy whatsoever. I was like, this is great. I don't have to go outside. I don't have to see anybody. This is awesome. (laughs) So my dream is always to like actually own like a little island and then build a house on it. And then I'm the only one on the island and then I don't have to deal with anybody. I can just close the world out. Actually, recently I've, I've been thinking about getting my pilot's license. Nice. If I could get my pilot's license, maybe I could build like a little runway and just fly wherever I wanted to whenever. Would you want it to be an island in hot weather or cold weather? I'm a cold weather person. If there's one thing I hate the most, it's laying out in the sun. Like California, everyone loves the dry heat. I don't. It feels like I'm in in an oven and it makes my skin hurt. So if I can get someplace with humidity and it's hot, it's not as bad. But I like the cold weather a lot more. When I first moved to Los Angeles from the Seattle area, I was really surprised by how happy I was. Mm -hmm. I think because it was sunny all the time. But then the monotony and almost the sort of unconscious like lack of clocking time. Yeah, that's the thing is, I mean, I grew up with seasons. Right. I miss that a lot because, I mean, you have fall here, but it's still 80 degrees out. I mean, it's kind of nice, but I like the seasons. I like just get a change of feeling. That was the thing someone always told me is like, you can always put more clothes on when it's cold, but if it gets hot, you can't just keep taking clothes off. (laughs) You know, at some point you got to (laughs) stop. And especially if you're shooting in the heat when... I was in my early 20s and first starting to work in the film industry. And the things that surprised me that maybe people who aren't in the industry don't know is I think like the hours of work are totally life consuming. Yes. It's funny you say that because, I mean, most people don't realize, I mean, very rarely do you do less than a 12 hour day. For me, 90% of the time, way more. Like specifically for Cobra Kai, I mean, we try to do as much of the fighting as we possibly can. We just finished season four. That's coming out at the end of the year. Are you beat? I definitely was when we finished because we had about two weeks of fighting days and it's just fighting all day. And you get your 30 minute break for lunch. We're all very determined to do everything. So we're doing it because we want to. They're not forcing us to. They're like, do you want to take a break? We're like, no, just keep going. (laughs) Roll the cameras. We're fighting now. Let's go. But specifically when I work, I go home and I can't sleep for three and a half months. I was basically only getting one to two hours of sleep. Is that because your mind is racing at night? Is it hard to calm it down? Yeah. Yeah. So I just thinking about what I have the next day. Okay, we have choreography we got to learn. Okay, this is the schedule. What do, I, what do I need to be in? You know, it's just, I just can't shut my mind off. That's just the way my mind works. When I get home, I, I hibernate for about two days where I'll sleep for like 12 to 14 hours. And then I'm, then I'm pretty much ready to go again. But it is a lot. I mean, for everybody on set, because that's just about how everybody works. That one thing is a big difference, I think. Mm-hmm. When I got Scary Movie and I first, we started shooting, yeah. I was like, 
people can't work like this. Yeah. How are people surviving working 16-hour days? Or, And it's a boring difference to talk about, but it is a massive one, is just truly the hours that you're logging at your job. Yeah, it's a very huge difference. Tanner, I'm really impressed with your work ethic. Were they both supportive, your folks? Extremely, yeah. Were they anxious about you two? I don't know. I think, um, you know, my parents didn't have very good upbringings. So my dad is, like I said, he's worked hard labor actually from like the age of 14. And he's turning 64 this year. So he's worked hard labor for 50 years. And he's always, he's just like, I just want you to do what makes you happy. You know, I don't want you to have to ever work as hard as I've had to which is very nice. And my mom has always had the same outlook he has. Is I just want you to do what you want to do. Even when I was younger, they were like, if you want to act, you know, we've been out here. I came out basically to California to try acting. And they're like, we'll try it for six months. If you like it, you know, we'll stay. If you don't, we'll go home. And after six months, we just never left. <laughs> so they've always been supportive. Even if I wanted to quit acting today, they'd be like, that's fine. What do you want to do? I'm very lucky. How did you digest like early rejection? My mom always brought me up of don't care what people think. So when I was young, I actually too, I I wore glasses and I had an eye patch and she knew possibly people might make fun of me that I have an eye patch. She was like, just tell people you're a pirate. That's cool. I was like, absolutely. I'm a pirate. I wear a patch. I'm different than all of you and I'm cool. And then when I started dancing, it was like, Of course I dance. Why wouldn't I? I get to be with girls after school all day and I'm cool. And so my mom always made sure that anything that might get in my way or if I would get made fun of it, it's not a big deal. I get to do what I want to do. I enjoy myself. And because I do that, I'm cool. So actually, when I came out to California to try acting and I didn't get jobs or I went on audition after audition after audition, it's just like, oh, that's fine. I'll just go on the next one. So it started from an early age back in Ohio that I just, I didn't care what people thought. And that's my outlook now is like, if you like me, you like me. If you don't, you don't. I'm just me and take it or leave it. That's rad. I mean that because I don't think I had that at all. Tanner, (laughs) I'll tell you all about my journey later. Yeah, go for it. (laughs) Do you have a favorite movie that you could watch over and over? Yeah, Singing in the Rain. You know, it's got the tap dancing, it's got the performing, it's got the acting. It's that feel-good movie of you just can't help but smile when you watch it. So I guess I guess that would be one of the movies that I, you know, enjoy and inspired me to do what I do today. Do you collect anything? I'm a big car guy, a big motorcycle guy, and a big, obviously, guitar guy. So those are the three things I, I kind of hold on to. I actually restore old cars with my dad, like hot rods. Okay, not knowing much about cars at all. My first car was a 1972 Monte Carlo. Okay. This massive, like, Cabernet red color. It was beautiful. I crashed it on I-5. Oh. (laughs) Yeah. But it was amazing. You could have an entire party in there. You could fit. There were two big bench seats. I could barely touch the pedals. You could really fit like 20 people in this car and you could hear it coming from a quarter mile away at least. So tell me like a dream car or what are you restoring now? My first dream car was a 1969 Chevelle and that's actually what I'm restoring right now. Oh, beautiful. I've actually bought it when I was 12 years old and not great shape. And I've been working on it ever since. So almost 10 years now, I've been working on it for 10 years, just whenever I have time. Does it drive? <laughs> Doesn't drive yet. Okay. We're very, right. very close. This is kind of amazing. It's great because we've done everything ourselves. It's where I've kind of learned to do everything. I would say there's only about two weeks worth of work on it left. What is there left to do? Most of it's actually only the interior, which um, is a lot of wiring to set up kind of the setup I want. Is it in Ohio? It is in Ohio. Would you ever drive it to Los Angeles? My original thought was when I get it finished, I would drive it across the country and come to LA. But because I don't think we're going to finish it, I think I'm going to actually ship it out here and then have someone finish it here. And have like the interior work done. Yeah, because I want it a little bit more modernized. I want to be able to, you know, put an iPad in it so I can play the music I want to play and like put like an updated sound system in it. And 
just a little bit more modern, just to kind of do whatever I want to do with it. I think that'd be nice. Tanner, have you ever written a fan letter? I don't think I have. I always enjoyed school, but I absolutely hated English. And if there's one thing in school that I hated the most, it was writing. If I could get out of it, I got out of it. So I don't think I ever have written a fan letter. The reason why I asked this question is because I started to wonder about like the idea of fandom Mm -hmm. and when you're on the other side of it. And like my mom didn't encourage any kind of fandom. I never had any pictures of guys up on my wall. My dad is a total music snob. So I never like played any of my music or anything. Were you like a rabid fan of anything growing up? I loved the Cheetah Girls. That was actually my first concert that I went to. I looked up to them a lot. I don't get very crazy about actors. I guess that that's, you know, our world, you know, it's, it's normal. But I get kind of crazy with musicians. I don't know why. I get really weird around reality stars. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess you feel like you do know them because you're seeing their everyday life almost. Some fans, they feel like they know actors, but we're still playing characters, so we're a little bit different. But with reality stars, that would be interesting. I've never really met any reality stars before. Yeah, you would feel like you almost knew them because you watched their life. Here's what I've been pondering lately because I've tried to justify my... I try to rationalize my love of reality television Mm -hmm. because as a format, it's easily dismissed. But the fascination with what is being presented to us as reality, we view it and we search for the clues that will make it not real. You're not necessarily watching somebody have your average mundane life that 90% of our day is, I suppose. It's kind of like the fun look into of what most people don't get to experience, I guess. Yeah, it is kind of surreal in a sense because a lot of the population isn't going to experience that kind of life. They they find it interesting. I still find it interesting as well. The one I just discovered like last night was Love After Lockup. No, I've watched a lot of the lovey loves during the quarantine, like the the one I really enjoy um, where they go to the island, but they're all like players. Love Island? Yes, but they get to actually do the exercises where they find deeper in themselves and, and they, they I feel like they find themselves a little <laughs> bit more and they learn something about themselves. I love the transformation. I, re- I really like that one. <laughs> okay, what's the best advice you've ever been given? The best advice I've I've been given is from my parents of just do what makes you happy. I know that sounds cliche, but it's true. And I, I believe it 100% because anybody that ever asks me advice, I always try to give, I give that answer of truly do what makes you happy. Like we said earlier, that's why I don't mind working seven days a week. That's what makes me happy. I enjoy my time and it doesn't feel like work. Okay, Tanner, are you ready for Deal Breakers game? Yes, because I love games. Okay, they have a driver's license with someone else's photo and their name. Okay, so it's a stolen identity, basically. Or is it a fake ID? Like you took your friend's ID because they're 21 and you can... (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I think that's fine. I mean, that would be fine in my book. What would your assumption be? That they were just too young? That they had a fake ID? I mean, everybody's got to have a fake ID at some point in their life, I feel like. I got caught with mine. Did you? Yeah, by the cops. Oh! I did have to go to court. Oh, no. <laughs> it was fun. Oh, no. I had a fake ID, too. Um, okay, here's the deal. If I'm this age now, and I took someone out that was, like, 20. Yeah, that's fine. I don't see the problem with it, I guess. Yeah, if they're honest about it, I don't like liars. Okay, they throw away their jury duty summons. I don't know, because then comes in the question of how long is a jury duty summons going to take? Because you don't know. <laughs> how much time are you going to have to spend in the courtroom? Yeah. It's not a deal breaker to me because I've not gotten summoned yet. But I don't think I'd want to be because I don't want to be in charge of someone's fate, whatever that may be. You know, there's a lot going on with people even getting convicted of the wrong stuff. And I don't want to like, I can't do it. So no, it's not a deal breaker because I wouldn't want to do it myself. All right. They tell you they don't believe in marriage. I mean, if we're about to move in together and you, you like truly love each other and you're, you're going to spend your life together, if 
they don't want to get married, I, I guess I would be open to it, right? Maybe a deeper conversation, but if I love that person, then I guess it would, we might be able to come to a compromise. All right, I like that. They want to take you to a strip club. You know what? That's funny. I've never been to a strip club. Really? Never. Uh-uh. I'm not interested in going because I want to see anything. I'm interested in going because there's this idea that like it's the greatest thing in the world. And I don't understand why. It, it doesn't make sense to me. So if they wanted to go, I guess. I, I don't know. I think you would find it fascinating for... A shift in personality. Interesting. It sounds like I've been to a ton, but I have been to a few. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And in my experience, a lot of customers, it amplifies something in their personality. Not unlike Mm. a casino, I guess. Yeah. There's like a heightened, almost bravado. Interesting. After you go to a strip club, will you report back to me and tell me your experience? Yes, I will. I'll report back to you. Well, that's the funny thing is like, I don't want to go. The only reason I want to go is I want to observe people. That's what's interesting to me is observing everyone in there. But otherwise, I have no, I don't want to go. I don't like to be touched very often. Yeah. You want your island. (laughs) Yes, I want my island. I want to be away from everybody. Exactly. Okay, next deal breaker. You notice one of your Instagram posts is the wallpaper on their phone. If it's a first date, yeah, that would be a deal breaker. That'd be a little, that might be a little odd. Yeah. But I mean, if we're like, if we're moving in together, like I said, most likely we've yeah. been together for a decent amount of time, yeah. that, that would be okay. You yeah. know, it's, it's appreciation. So different situations, different, different feelings. I wanted to ask, I was watching something about you, like 10 things you don't know about Tanner. And one of them was your relationship with social media. Will you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, first off, I'm not a big techie guy in general. Social media is, um, it's interesting to me. I'm not, I'm not super big into it. I think it can be great, but I also think it can be extremely harmful to a lot of people because a lot of people don't use it for the right reasons. But it's just, if I have something to post, I'll post it. But I don't like taking pictures of myself. I don't... I'm so with you. I don't know. I just feel very, like, conceited. That, like, if I'm sitting there, like, taking pictures of myself, then posting it and being like, look at me, you know? I, I just, it's... I shy away from it a lot. It just makes me uncomfortable, I guess. I was thinking about when actors have to do photo shoots, how Mm -hmm. you have to suddenly look into the camera and acknowledge like your own sense of self in a kind of a vain way and how what we're trained to do is ignore it. And I have a hard time watching playback. I get sort of the images of my own facial movement kind of Mm -hmm. seared into my brain. I feel the same way because like it doesn't matter as many photo shoots as I do. I still feel extremely uncomfortable every time I show up. They want you to look in the camera and I'm constantly not making eye contact with the camera and like looking at, they're like, can you do one in the camera? And I'm like, I don't want to, but sure, fine, let's do it. I think this whole Zoom thing has been really hard. Like I keep glancing over, I'm like, what am I? (laughs) You look at yourself, you're like fixing your hair. You're like, maybe I shouldn't sit that way. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's very odd. But yeah, same thing with playback or even watching the final product. I used to not watch myself. But then I started watching myself because I finally learned you have to grow. And if you don't watch yourself, there's some things that you do. I noticed for myself that I did that was very repetitive that I didn't like. Oh, interesting. I think I had certain tics that I did, possibly if I was nervous on set that day or anything. Um, So I watch a lot for those, but I also have to stop myself from watching it a certain amount of times because if not, then I'll obsess over it. And that's not good as well. So I give myself like two or three times to watch it, learn from it, and try to grow from it. And that's all I care about. When I was a kid, I used to love back to school shopping. But my son is quick to point out that we're different in a lot of ways. With DoorDash, I don't have to interrupt Minecraft, get out of my sweats, or even get off the couch. From notebooks, pens, and pencils to peanut butter, jelly, and Wonder Bread, DoorDash can deliver all of the essentials right to your door with one-hour delivery. 
No more running to the store at the last minute to wait in long lines with everyone else who ran to the store at the last minute. No more combing the aisles as you check off every item on that list it took an hour to find. No more going back to the store when you realize that there were two sides to that list. Of course, you can also have dinner delivered after promising yourself that you'd only watch one more episode of White Lotus. With everything you need just to tap away, DoorDash is making sure you get the most out of this time with your family. It's easy, convenient, and your son won't complain that you're wasting his last day of vacation. Simplify your summer and download the DoorDash app today. This episode of Unqualified is brought to you in part by Babbel. How cool would it be to take a trip this summer and speak the language of where you're going? I took Italian in college, and when I finally went to Italy, I seemed to have forgotten pretty much everything. Of course, everyone in my family expected me to be their translator, and I was to blame for more than a few surprise lunch orders and longer than expected road trips. I did my best to convince everyone that the restaurant ran out of the chicken, pasta, or pizza, and the extra hour in the car was a very special scenic route. In one particular misunderstanding, I confirmed that, yes, my mom was, in fact, Olivia Newton-John. Everyone but my mom thought the mistaken identity was understandable, and somewhere out there, there is a photo of an Italian woman smiling with the beautiful and talented Karen Ferris. Babbel's comprehensive learning system was created by more than 100 language experts and designed with a focus on real-world conversation. After just a few weeks of 15-minute lessons, you'll have confidence that your lunch will arrive as ordered, and when you take an actual scenic route, you'll be able to entertain everyone in the car with your deeper understanding of the culture. Babbel makes everything fun, easy, and with less than a month of lessons, I already know more Italian than I did from my two years in a classroom. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to babbel.com and use promo code ANA. That's B-A-B-B-E-L.com, code ANA, for an extra three months free. Il mio amore vorrebbe una pizza. Pronto! All right. What was your first love like? I think it was wonderful. How old were you? Well, you call it first love, and then you look back and you're like, eh, was that love? Eh, eh. You know what I mean? But you think... Yeah, exactly. Love shifts, like, throughout your whole life. Yeah. Probably would have been uh, 13, 14. You know, you think you're on cloud nine, and... That's like your first love and you're going to last forever. And and that's just... Were you in a real relationship at that age? Yeah, I would think so. How long did that last? Uh, like two years. That's a young age to be in a committed relationship. Yes, I like to be in long relationships. I've kind of always been that way. I like it. I know I like it. And I'm happy with it. What qualities do you look for in a partner? Definitely hardworking. You know, I I want them to have the same drive that I do because they don't. Then they might get kind of annoyed with the way I work (laughs) or at least can understand that. Um, I like someone who is very creative. I do enjoy people that are in this business because they have a more understanding of it. Have you worked with somebody whose ability made them sexier? Hmm. Yeah. That's interesting you say that. I've never thought about it that way. But yes, I'd probably say that. I feel like sometimes that goes along with like passion for it as well. You know, if if their ability is there, a lot of time they have a deep passion for it and a deep love of it and that commitment that they have that makes it, yeah, sexy. Okay, so you had this two-year relationship when you were young. And then did you move to Los Angeles? Is that what ended it? Or was it just natural progression? What ended it? No, it was just natural, natural progression of just, we're going into high school, (laughs) you know? Yeah. We're kind of like doing our own thing. It was, uh, she broke up with me, actually. And I was just like, "Uh, okay, I guess I'll do my own thing. I definitely cried over that. I remember that. I was like crying in the car while she was like breaking up with Uh me, I think. So did you go into another relationship after that? What was the time frame like? No, I didn't get into another relationship-ish, if you would call it that, for about more than a year. 
Can I ask what your worst heartbreak was like? Yes. Uh, I was like, for probably about a month and a half straight, I would cry every night. I don't mean just like cry. I mean like ball. till so just like I tired myself out and just made myself go to sleep and just had a bunch of breakdowns. And every night I would put on repeat the fault in our stars. <laughs> Do you mind my asking how old you were? 17 or 18. Yeah, that's the sweet spot of heartbreak. I would show up at this guy's fraternity, my first boyfriend who broke up with me all the time, just like pathetic in the rain. Like, yeah. has anyone <laughs> seen? But we were going to get married. I don't think yeah. I actually <laughs> spoke those words, but it was a feeling of physical devastation. Yeah, it was definitely interesting of like that heartbreak of you can't live on without this person, you know. Did they break up with you? Yes, they did. I will admit it was my fault. I was actually kind of being an ass during that time. So they had every right to. Why do you think you were being an ass? I don't know. I don't know what it was inside of me that felt like I could act a certain way that I was acting, but I did anyway. And then I was devastated. That was definitely a reality check for me. Like, to me, I felt like I truly lost everything. And I don't ever want to act that way again or be that person again. It was a very big learning experience, which was nice. I don't think most people are able to reflect on a relationship like that. I think it's really impressive. I've been in a couple of relationships, especially when I was younger, with people who... They were behaving in a way that was like forcing my hand. Like I had mm -hmm. to break up with them if I had any yeah. shred of self-respect. So it's interesting that you're able to kind of look back at that. Did you ask for her back? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and what happened? It was a no-go? We're together now. You are? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that makes me so happy. We're together now. She's upstairs currently. Tanner, you were pointing up. Yeah. <laughs> and you were talking about the faults in our stars. Oh, you got you got scared for a I second. I was. I was like, fuck. You're like, where is this going? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you're like, shit. You're, I'm talking about we're together <laughs> now. And you're like, oh, I opened a deep hole right now. No, she's up. She's upstairs. <laughs> she's upstairs. Well, okay. What's your girlfriend's name? Uh, her name is Lizzie Broadway. Does she know that you're doing this podcast right now? Yeah, she does. Well, I would love to say hi to her. I'm dying to know <laughs> if she remembers this the same way. I think this is oh, so yeah. amazing. No, she remembers it the same way. We, I mean, we still talk about some of the stuff about when we were, you know, younger and how we've, we've had a lot of conversations about how we've, you know, grown as people. Tanner, how did you get her back? What happened? I don't know what I did. <laughs> I'm happy I did, though. <laughs> no, I bet she knows. Tanner, can you ask her to come down? Let's see. I love this. Hi. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm Lizzie. Nice to meet you. So I was asking Tanner about his worst heartbreak, and he was talking about... Oh, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Maybe. <laughs> when I was in Canada, when we were oh, like... Oh, yeah, and you watched Fault in Your Stars for like... <laughs> yes. Days yes. and days because you were so sad. Yeah. I'm all so I, sorry. All I told her was I was an ass. Yeah, I don't it, even but, remember anymore. But she, yeah. Yeah. Well, for so long. Well, that's what she... Uh, so he was telling us that he was totally devastated. And then I said, well, what did you do to get her back? And he, he laughed and he said, I'm not sure. So it, you gave me an ultimatum. And I was too afraid to lose you. Did I? Yeah, you're like, I can't I can't talk to you anymore if we don't get back together. And I was like, being 17, because we've been together for six years now, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm still an ass. <laughs> I was still an ass. Well, I was an asshole, too. I mean, yeah. grown together. I, I love well, you. Yeah, I love sure. You. Every, okay. This is amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love you. Make sure. Yeah. So it's kind of like uh, being so young, you don't know anything, but you just instinctively know that, oh, I can't lose this person. Yeah. And it's kind of crazy. So, like, I mean, we're, how old are you? I, I, was, I, was, I was 17. I was 17, 18. Yeah. So, I mean, that's uh, as much as I'm 23 now. So, it's. That's what, well, that's what you're talking about is like in a short time frame of how much you learn about yourself. Yeah. Because I didn't know who the hell I was, too, you know? And you didn't probably know who you were. <laughs> no. No, we had no idea. But, like, maybe it's fate. I don't know. Like, magic. But. As much as we didn't know about ourselves, we kind of just 
I knew you. Yeah. Ask me in five years, but yeah, we'll find, we'll find out. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just kind of like that. I, I don't distinctly remember. It was just like so long ago. I know. Lizzie, are you prepared to move to an island? Yeah, I told her like one of my no. dreams. Where, Sorry. where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at you now. I'm like, well, do you know something? Don't worry. There's an awesome outhouse. <laughs> and like some fucking kick-ass lanterns. <laughs> no, um, we were just talking about sort of island paradise, but I wanted to ask you guys, how has quarantine been? Have you grown closer because of this last year? Yeah, we learned a lot about ourselves and each other. Well, you took care of me for four months. I was really sick. I didn't know what was wrong with me. Like I was having all these stomach issues and I was so bad that I couldn't even like go unload the dishwasher. And this guy took care of me for four months on my like deathbed, it felt like. I mean, like that's a lot of time we spent like talking about our relationship and everything and and learning about ourselves and just spent a long time seeing where we could do better and where we've not done as well in the past. Yeah. You know, like where do, where can we communicate better? But yeah, it was a beautiful, horrible, amazing experience. Like yeah. everyone, <laughs> everyone around us like was not doing well. And we're like, we're just peaceful and quarantined, just figuring out our learning. Skills. We're just learning about each other and going from there. What advice would you guys give to couples in general? communication. That was a big thing for me. I, I, I mean, I've gotten a lot better at it. I still need to work at it for sure. But communication for me uh, was a big game changer. If you got like upset with something, would you tend to bottle it up? Yes. Yeah. And that's like being able to use your words in order to talk to your significant other, you know, and say, mm-hmm. this is how I feel, or maybe necessarily, uh, I don't like this, you know, and it's not trying to get into like a big fight, but, you know, knowing that you can have the communication and talk to one another and try to figure it out. Was your dad like that? No, I think that's where I learned it from is of not communicating, just bottling it up and then like it'll pass. Right. But that's what I've been trying to work on myself. It's worked for me to become a better person and and try to truly communicate. And have a conversation, even though I may hate the conversation, right? Because I think you'll learn more about yourself and the relationship in general. How did you guys meet? Oh, it's a long but short story. (laughs) So we knew each other when we were nine. I had no recollection of this because he was never my focus. Also, you looked like 10 years younger than I did when we were the same age. (laughs) So... Um, We met at a beach and then... Through a mutual friend. Yeah. And then we didn't see each other at all. And then we met each other in a class. And my, I saw him and I was like, wow, you grew up. And fine. Yeah. (laughs) And his mother was right there. So I'm like, oh, I'll just talk to his mom, you know, (laughs) just like "Mm, play my cards at 17. And that's literally, that's, that's it. I was really aggressive now. It kind of sounds like how most of my relationships started, like not with like <laughs> any kind of formality or like even like a proper date. Yep, that's we that's don't even basically have an anniversary. No, we don't. There's no anniversary whatsoever. We're like maybe it's in the fall. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. You know what? We should talk about he's all that. Oh, sure. Yeah. Have you been having to do a shit ton of press for it? I've actually only really had about two days of it as of now. It's not been that bad. What's been like the question that keeps popping up? The big one is, is like, how was it working with Addison Ray and her first time, you know, acting? And of course, what they're really asking is if you think she can act. That's 100% what they're asking. I know that's right. what they're asking. Right. You know, they, they, right. they're saying it in a very polite way, but that is what they're asking. I have no problem answering it to say that, yes, yeah. you can. Watch the movie, Fuck please. Yeah. That makes me really happy. Tanner, you're awesome. It was so great meeting you. This has been amazing. Thank you so much. And please thank Lizzie for me. Thank you. I, I had a lot of fun doing this, so I appreciate it. You're fantastic. It. <laughs> thank you, Tanner. Have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. Bye. Bye. This episode of Unqualified is brought to you in part by Osea. My husband recently told me how nice my skin looked. 
Granted, he's usually pretty complimentary, but this particular compliment was more specific than usual. As I've been thinking about finally leaving the house this summer, it was certainly confidence boosting. Female founded and family operated by a mother and daughter team, Osea has been making skin and body care products since 1996. My love for Osea began more recently when I tried their award-winning Hyaluronic C Serum. With a combination of hyaluronic acid and three nutrient-rich seaweeds, the serum smooths fine lines and leaves your skin hydrated all day long. After loving the serum, I then purchased their best-selling seaweed-infused Ocean Cleanser. Even for sensitive skin, this cleanser exfoliates and removes surface impurities while leaving your skin feeling soft and refreshed. I've always been skeptical of body oil, but their Andaria Algae Body Oil changed my mind. It absorbs quickly, isn't greasy, and like all of their products, it smells amazing. After my husband's compliment, I ordered a Sea Minerals Mist and Red Algae Mask. I also noticed that someone has been secretly using my cleanser. All of Osea's ingredients are responsibly sourced, plant-derived, clean, and cruelty-free. Good for your skin and good for the planet. Reveal your summer glow with skincare from Osea and get 10% off all products on your first order with promo code ANA at OseaMalibu.com. You also get free samples in every order and free shipping on orders over $50. That's 10% off with code ANA at OseaMalibu. O-S-E-A-M-A-L-I-B-U dot com. Maybe you're feeling down or struggling with uncertainty. Maybe you're having difficulty sleeping or meeting your goals. Maybe it's time you talk with someone. BetterHelp offers online professional counselors who can listen and help. BetterHelp counselors have expertise in a broad range of areas, including anxiety, grief, depression, trauma, relationship conflicts, self-esteem, and more. Easily schedule confidential, secure video or phone sessions from anywhere in the world. Plus, exchange unlimited messages with your therapist to get the help you need on your own time, at your own pace, and at an affordable rate. Financial aid is also available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today and is committed to matching you with a great therapist. Just start by filling out a questionnaire and start communicating with your counselor in under 48 hours. Unqualified is sponsored by BetterHelp and our listeners get 10% off their first month of online therapy at betterhelp.com slash Ferris. So visit betterhelp.com slash F-A-R-I-S and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced BetterHelp professional. Hey everyone, April Beyer is back now officially as my much needed co-host. As you know from previous episodes, April brings great advice, insight, and years of experience. I am so thrilled to have her. Will you tell us what's going on, Esther? Sure. So my husband and I got married a year and a half ago, but we have been together for six years. Everything happened so quickly. We met and I was going to school, working on my post-grad degree, and I was struggling financially. I lost the house I was renting, the car that I had, it bank took it back, and I was just having issue keeping up with my bills. I didn't have a support system. I still don't. And I had met him two weeks prior, all this happening, and he said, well, move in with me. And at first I said, no, I can't do that. I don't believe in moving in with, you know, your boyfriend before you get married. And also, I just met you two weeks ago. So I didn't know anything about him. He didn't know anything about me. We met online. So it was very <laughs> scary. And but I didn't have a choice. It was either leaving the street or moving in with him. So moving with him. And I was also a little concerned because I do have a strong personality. <laughs> But things went well. We worked really well. We got along super well. And uh, for a year and a half, things were great. 
And right before the two years mark in our relationship, something was off. We were fighting a lot. And so I went through his phone and found some text between him and his ex and I uh, confronted him. And he said that, yes, he had cheated. I was very hurt. I told him I need to move out. I had a job then. And so it wasn't like I couldn't move out, but, you know, it was just a lot to do if I wanted to. And so he's like, I'll help you financially. I'll help you look for an apartment. So we did. I even applied for an apartment. So we worked through our issues and got engaged a year later and got married two years after. Last week, something was seemed different. And it was really like sudden because we're good. We're trying to conceive as in last week. So, oh, God, <laughs> Esther. I told him, I said, I can't wait to have like, you know, a little one to look like us. Um, so he was very excited too. That's what he said anyways. And last four or five days ago, he was off, way off. And I was like, something is up. What's going on? So I checked his phone. I don't do that. Only time I did that was that time four years ago. And I found some deleted messages between him and his ex, the same girl. So here we are. <laughs> Esther, I am so sorry. It's such a particular kind of pain and devastation, the idea of infidelity. In your letter, you wrote that he came home at 2 a.m. drunk and told you that you were being controlling. Yeah, so that's Saturday. He asked me to go and do some um, activities with his guy friends, which I told him it's fine. You know, you need your a long time away from me. So he went and did that, but it got late and he's never home after 9 p.m. And 1 a.m. came around. And so I said, hey, where are you? I, you know, I asked him and he kept saying he was with his guy friend. And I know the guy friend very well. And I knew he wasn't the guy to be out and about after midnight. And so that's when I told him, this is bull crap. If I were to ask him right now, if you're with him, will he say yes? And he said, yeah. But then I later find out that he had texted him and asked him to cover for him. So when 1.30 a.m. hit, I said, either get here in 10 minutes, I'm packing my stuff and I'm leaving. So he got here 30 minutes after. And I said, well, where are you? He said, I was in downtown when I texted you. And I said, why did it take you 30 minutes to get here? It should take you 10. Oh, I stopped at McDonald's. And so I was like, okay, if I go to the car, I'm going to, you know, smell some fast food. I went on <laughs> investigation mode. I was just like, so like something is off. And so I went to the car, not received. There's nothing smell like fast food. And so I came back and I said, no, he was completely drunk. So I kept waking him up and asking him, can you please tell me, you know, what's going on? And he started yelling, nothing. It's, it's, why are you doing? Trust me. You're supposed to trust me. You are my wife. Um, you're being controlling, you're, you know, you're watching too many uh, podcasts, like crimes and investigating me like they I do. I know this story, <laughs> the gaslighting story. Yeah. So for sure. Like, oh, you're a crazy actress. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, you're cheating on me. Yeah. No, I knew it. I have been with a guy for six years. Okay. I know his behavior. So I just knew. Are you guys sort of functioning in the house as strangers kind of right now? How is the current situation? I want to point out before we go further, that he did say he didn't sleep with her. They were just talking and hanging out. I believe him, believe her now. I don't know why. I do believe him. He didn't sleep with her. But I told him that's not the point. The point is, why do you have to message her in the first place? Because he was the one that messaged her first. Last time it was her that messaged him. So anyways, um, I told him it didn't matter whether he slept with her or not. You know, it's all the line. And that this time I needed to move out. So right now he is working. He has two jobs. I do two. We're really busy. And I see him when he comes in the house. He goes to shower, have dinner, and then go to bed. And that's how we are functioning. He's sleeping in this very couch. And I sleep in our bathroom. I'm so sorry that you're going through this. It's like you're living your stress right there in your home. Right. And that's what I told him. It's, yeah. Esther, wow, we really feel for you. 
Can I ask you what was the like the intimacy level of the messages between the two of them when you read those text messages? So this time around, it was a quick message. She just said, "Hey, I've been thinking about you lately. Um, life is crazy, if you ask me. How are you?" And her response was a phone call. This was through Facebook messaging, and so he thought he deleted it. But when I typed her name on the phone, everything came back up. They talked for thirty minutes, and then he called her back, and then she called back. So it was like a total of five messages or calls and two texts, and then he was there with her, and then whatever happened, and then he came back home at two a.m. Yeah, drunk, very drunk. Yeah, and had his friend lie for him. Yeah, and he deleted that text message to his friend, but I saw that the last message to his friend was at one thirty a.m. So I only saw the, the timestamp. And it was the same time I asked him where he was, and that I was gonna ask the friend if he was with him. So I put two and two together, and I knew that's why it was. So yeah, I think you're so in PI mode, and you're good at and it. You're good at it. <laughs> uh, speaking of, you know, my brother is in that business, and he doesn't do that kind of work, but he has often said when women or men go to somebody and say, "Hey, find out if my partner is cheating," he usually says no because they either are and your marriage is over, or there's zero communication and trust, and your relationship is over. So it doesn't matter if you find out what is going on, because the mind has a funny way of playing with you, right? You believe him that he didn't, but all of the facts that you've laid out are he is doing something private without your knowledge. Mm -hmm. He's reconnecting with somebody he did sleep with. He had a friend lie. He lied about what he did on the way back. So I'm not sure why you are believing him when he says he didn't sleep with her, when everything else that is packed around the story has been found out to be false. So let's act as if he did. Let's just play for a second. If he did, what is it that you want to do? The $1 million question. <laughs> um, I love him. He's my husband. And I believe that he loves me. I mean, I struggle when it first happened to believe that, you know, after all this, he put me through this twice. For what I've seen, it's, he's very confused or was confused. Now he's very, you know, feels a lot of remorse and he cried so much. I've never seen him crying this much. But I guess I really want to know if there is a way that I can get that space that I need from him being staying in this house because... <laughs> I didn't do it last time. And I, I feel like I should have left the house completely and spent time away from him. So is marriage the element that's different now? Yes. So you had reached a closer breaking point of separation before you were married, as opposed to this time when you're kind of feeling like I should see this through because of the institution of marriage or because of the relationship? Or can you differentiate? One, because of the marriage, I feel that it's a big deal. We make vows to uh, stay together through better or for worse, but I believe he didn't sleep with her. I know there's still a lot of lying and the trust, and you know, I do not appreciate how he, I told him this, it made me feel like I was going crazy because when I was asking him, not yelling, I was asking him to tell me the truth. I kept saying, can you please, can you please tell me the truth? And he kept insisting he was with a guy's friend. And so... At some point in that conversation, I was like, I really hope I'm not wrong and, you know, blaming him like this and going off on him. And so it's the line that really hurts me. In my 20s, I was in a relationship like this, but we moved in together after like three or four months of dating. He cheated on me when we were just living together. We got married and then the pattern continued to repeat itself. And I felt really small along the way. And we would have these irrational, nonsensical arguments. It felt like he was determined to be angry at me. And I couldn't figure out why. It felt terrible. I didn't realize how unhappy I was until after I left him. And my friends were like, oh my God, you're so happy. I don't know if divorce is in your future, Esther. I don't want you to have to like kind of tackle that mental hurdle right now. Mm -hmm. unless April wants you to, <laughs> then I'll support her. Well, we talk about that a lot, right, Anna? Like, we hear these stories, and then when we say you don't have to think about divorce right now, there's so many steps that come before that, right? So, of course, you don't have to think about that right now, but you do have to think about what this is. Because when you talk about love, does love make you feel imbalanced? 
Does love make you feel like you've gone completely mad? Does love lie? It doesn't. People do. And sometimes we conflate those two, right? We say, well, we've made our vows. And so marriage is important through sickness and in health, through good and bad. But in those vows, we also commit that we'll be honest and we'll be truthful and loyal and faithful. And when you have a problem with a partner who has a habitual pattern of this, you are no longer dealing with a marital issue. You're dealing with a character issue. So Esther, it's not really up to you to quote unquote work on this. This is his deal. And Anna, what you were saying about your relationship where there was a lot of anger pointed at you, I honestly feel like a lot of people do this when they don't feel like they're on your level. And so they go, they throw a lot of anger your way as a way of kind of sabotaging it. Whether they're aware of it or not, that's what they're doing. They're making it acrimonious. They're making it difficult and challenging. So when this other stuff happens, they can say, well, we fight all the time. It's a way of pushing away intimacy and pushing away that partner. And Esther, I don't know what kind of dating history you had. I think you were young when you met him. But did you have any full year, two-year relationships before you met him? I did. I had my first when I was 16, but I was a late bloomer and I didn't get physical with um, him even though we were together for three years, but we were best friends. We were officially dating. He met my family and everything. We still talk to this day, occasionally, not too much, our respect for each other's spouses, but he was my best friend growing up. And so when I was old enough, 16, um, you know, he became my boyfriend of three years. We were engaged and it was wonderful. And then after that, I I had another two years relationship too that was very toxic and two, three years a long distance. And yeah, I knew from the get-go that was very toxic. Right. And after that relationship, how long was it before you met your now husband? Um, I had, besides those two, I had a brief one of four months before I met him. My thought, Esther, is that you know, 16 to 19 almost doesn't even count. I'm so glad you had a beautiful, lovely relationship, but engaged to somebody between the ages of 16 and 19, you're a child, you're a child at that time. And then to go into that, into a two-year, my thought is that you lean on men for your security, that you haven't been on your own enough to realize just how smart and strong and independent You went for your post-grad. You're a smart girl. You're a hardworking girl. You can do anything on your own. But there is this pattern of you being with men without knowing that you can stand on your own two feet. Does that make sense? Yes, definitely. April, I feel like you could have described me the same way. Really? Completely. Yeah, we forget how amazing we are, you know, and what we can do. And And it's so hard when you're younger and you don't have that prior experience of kind of accomplishing on your own. And and if we're young and we don't have any money and then we move in with somebody, I mean, it's kind of awesome that you guys found this amazing relationship and love and marriage Mm -hmm. at a time where out of default, you moved in. You know, Mm -hmm. if you had had a nice bank account at that time and had your own place, you wouldn't have moved in with them. Your gut, right? your instincts, which are just like inherent in us, as humans, we're screaming at you saying, it's too soon. I don't know this person. But you're like, I had to because I didn't have a choice. And Anna, how many women do this? Like, because of a financial issue, everybody moves in and then tries to make that relationship work. Yeah, Esther, in the relationship that I was talking about, I remember after catching him literally walking in, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I didn't have enough money to like get him off of my lease. He didn't have any income. So it was kind of like, I guess I have to forgive him. It just felt so exhausting and tormenting. I probably spent a lot more time tormenting myself, like trying to put the pieces together of like, wait, there was that one time that he was like over the, you know, like running that hamster wheel. And I'm grateful for all my experiences, but I do harbor a little resentment. I felt like a neurotic, crazy person because I was told that all the time. And that was really hard to digest all the time. I don't know if your husband does exactly those things, but I really flagged in your email, you know, when you wrote that he said that you were being controlling. 
I used to hear that shit all the time. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's always controlling when you don't want somebody to cheat on you. (laughs) So I think April is exactly right that this isn't yours, yet you're living with it. And I think that he may need to understand what it does to you and how it makes you feel. I think it's best just to figure out ourselves first. And then once we have that foundation, then we can tackle as a team, like what's going on. But I don't care if he actually slept with her. It's almost like... May as well. (laughs) Might as well, because... Yeah. Yeah, I don't care. Because the lying, if you're lying to me at all, it's so against the grain of who I am as a person. So I know that when somebody I'm working with or living with or partnering with is out of their integrity, it doesn't matter why, because it's not how I operate. So can I forgive somebody when they're out of integrity? Sure, because holding anger and hostility is like drinking poison. But do I want to stay in that environment when there's too many people that do operate from integrity? That's the choice you have to make. And when somebody cries like that, like, I'm sorry, I've really messed up. It's been, I'm so like, oh my gosh, that's more about him, Esther, than it is about, I love you. He might be saying, I love you. Take me back. I'm sorry. I didn't do anything. I should have told you that I was talking to her. I'm crying. The crying is from a different place that has zero to do with love. So please don't hear that or see that and then fall right back into it because that's what happens, right? We hear the crying and we see it. We're like, oh, I love you too. That's exactly what he's doing. He's like, I can't believe I screwed up the best years I have in my life. I can't believe I ruined us. <laughs> yeah, but did you hear that? I can't believe yeah. I, I screwed up. I, 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 I. He's still making it about him and not mm-hmm. about you. Because if he was making it about you, he probably wouldn't cry. You're the one that's supposed to be crying. <laughs> not him. I've done my share already. <laughs> I understand. But that's that's a way of controlling you. That's that projection thing, right? When somebody goes, you're controlling. Well, there's a little bit of controlling of you going on right now, too. It's just done differently. You're a little bit more direct. You're outspoken. You seem to have a lot of integrity. What was your family dynamic? Like, what were you told about women, men, marriage when you were growing up? The opposite of what I believe <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean it's what I'm doing, but I come from a background where women are very submissive. Yeah. And it's almost okay for the guy to cheat and be abusive in any form or shape. And the wife has to forget and forgive and go back to their spouse. My mom <laughs> even said to me once, You're never going to find a guy. Basically, I'm the opposite of what I'm supposed to be. She said, you're so strong will, you do whatever you want, and you know, you're know supposed to be submissive, the guy has the last word, and I always knew that's not how it should work. And before this, I don't think we had that. I don't think he is or was controlling, and he checks with me on everything, really, so we make decisions together, and so that's what I liked about him. But yeah, going back to your question, that's how it is where I'm from. Where are you from originally? The Caribbean. So it's interesting. That is still playing in you because all of your family and ancestors believed that that's the way life is, that the men are the decision makers, that men can screw up and that women have to defer and women have to be submissive and women must forgive and forget. So you're literally dueling with who you are today as a woman who's very smart and accomplished and driven and strong-willed and the old kind of historical stuff from family lineage because you don't have a support system. So you're feeling alone. And then when you are reaching back and connecting back to family, they're not supporting you in the, are you nuts? Get the heck out of there, right? Because their training is, yes, stay. We can forgive, but we should never, ever forget. And it's impossible anyway, right? It's always there. And forgiveness doesn't mean you stay. Forgiveness is you forgive, then it must take an action along with your forgiveness. No one ever said forgiveness meant, I forgive you, let's stay in this. It's I forgive you, but now I need to make a decision for me as a human being and as a woman. And history will keep repeating itself. So what I recommend to you, Esther, is that you build your network. You build your community of women who are as educated as you are, strong-willed as you are, independent, found a way to make it on their own, 
don't believe in infidelity because you need the other voice in your head saying, what do you want to do? And that your mental well-being is everything. If you lose your self-esteem and your well-being, how you feel about yourself, this will repeat itself either with him or with everybody else. And what happens as you get older, it's like chipping away. It's like, it's like water that erodes a rock. It just keeps going and going and going. And you wake up and you're 40 and you're 50 and suddenly going, where did I go? Who am I? This is just old stuff that you're doing. And so how can we get you into a place of empowerment so that you can really put this on the table and get some clarity around it to help you slowly make some decisions? Because the divorce thing or the separation thing or living apart from him will and I believe should happen. However, there are things to do now to help you do those things. If you try to do those things before you have figured out how you want to be treated, what does marriage mean to you? How do you feel safe? How do you feel love? Unless you do those things and what you feel you deserve in this lifetime, you can't do the stuff. We could tell you to move out tomorrow. It's not going to stick because you've got to fix yourself first. And then slowly those decisions will be very easy to make. They're just not easy to make when you don't know who you are yet. That attempt to regain independence was a crazy journey filled with highs and lows. And Esther, I so agree, and I hope it's not too painful to hear or it makes you too uncomfortable that whether or not he slept with her this last time is sort of a moot point, you know? And it seems to me that it's easy for you to forgive him and move on by believing that they didn't sleep together. But I do believe that you're in a relationship with somebody who will continue to make you feel insecure and bad and not be a generous partner in the way that maybe you want until he does his own work. That's the part of the control that we just don't have and that you don't have. I remember the realization of, oh, I can't make an unhappy person happy. I just can't do it. I can't fix his behavior. He used to say things like, you know, you're the only person who understands me. You know how depressed I get. So I was being like pulled and then like, you're crazy. You're so insecure. Well, that was such a tough way to live. And so when I finally... When I finally left him, it was scary, but it really felt like a backpack had just been lifted from my shoulders and just set down on the sidewalk. (laughs) I physically felt lighter. Esther, as you're listening to us and you can see Anna... Reliving your experience. (laughs) Right? And you you can see how happy Anna is and you can see that she weathered that and she's been through that and relates to you and knows exactly what you're going through. But then you see and listen to a woman that's on the other side of all of that. Does that give you some kind of courage or hope? Yes, it sounds very scary. Um, I almost know what I need to do is to get in there. It's been a struggle. Yeah, I'm so sorry. There will be highs (laughs) and lows. When I was going through my divorce, I went from having like a fridge constantly stocked because I love to cook and I'm kind of, you know, a homemaker and I was always entertaining to living in this funky, cool apartment because my husband wouldn't leave my house. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) To having like mustard and like a six pack of beer in the fridge. And that was it. (laughs) And it felt like, who is this person? She's kind of (laughs) fun. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah but I love that picture Anna of the mustard and whatever and like hardly anything in the fridge <laughs> and a smaller little place because even if you downsize and you don't have the life that you had it's kind of cool right like where all of a sudden you have like I'm on my own and I can do this like right I can do with a lot less I was like oh my god I'm making every decision and I don't have to check in with anybody (laughs) this is awesome yeah yeah (laughs) especially somebody who didn't make me feel very good you know well you know there's there's so many ways to betray our partners in a marriage sex with somebody else is just another kind of betrayal. But a lot of people like to think that sex with somebody else is this ultimate betrayal. But there's betrayals along the way, long before there's sex with another partner. 
there's something that is missing. There's something that is being overlooked. It's just a symptom, right? You guys, Esther, you've been fighting a lot or you were fighting a lot in the past. So we've all heard the expression, once a cheater, always a cheater. I do believe that people can come back from affairs. I do. I truly do. But it depends on how it played out. What was going on? What was the quality of the relationship ahead of time? What are both parties willing to do? And to rebuild trust is a whole other dynamic where if you guys went to a therapist, the therapist would say, okay, if you guys want to rebuild this and you really want your marriage to work, what is going on with you that you feel like you need something else? Are you not getting attention at home? What is this connection with this other person? It was that the only other person. And what are you going to do going forward that's going to make Esther feel secure? Now, a lot of people want to be forgiven, but they want to go right back to what they had before. Game over. It will never be the same as what it was before. I don't mean to tell you that to break your heart. I mean to tell you that so that you know that sometimes things have to completely break for new things to be built. The new model of your relationship is 100,000% transparency, meaning sometimes husbands and wives too, if they've cheated, are asked to like, okay, well, you go to work and you need to check in with her at 9 a.m., 12 a.m., 3 p.m. Until that partner, it could be a year, it could be six months, it could be two years, until that partner has rebuilt that feeling of, okay, I'm secure, I'm okay. The person who did the cheating has to do double time work to rebuild trust within the partner by almost overly communicating about everything they are doing, everything that they are to the point of like over the top, because that's the only thing. Time is the only thing that solves this, but time is just an aspect of it. What do you do with that time going forward? By the way, Esther, can you stay in the house and he go? <laughs> so that's, he offered that. He said, if you want to stay in the house, his parents are two houses away, uh, his grandparents, but he refused. He doesn't want to go there. He says, I'm not going back to my, I've been living on my own since I was 18. I'm not going back to my parents or my grandparents. He said, if you want me to leave the house, I'll sleep in the car. And I don't want to do that. And also his business is in the backyard. So even if he moves out, he's going to come and work here every day. And so we were planning on selling the house in a month. So I told him, why don't we just sell the house? And with that money, that'll be enough to pay a lease for a year for each one of us get an apartment. So I suggested that. Yeah, this is perfect. This is great news, Esther. Right? <laughs> I mean, Anna, yeah. could the timing be any better? Okay, so keep him on the couch for the entire month and move towards selling the house. This is great because it's in 30 days. What's awesome about this is that you're already in a place where there's a transition happening. Yes, yeah. exactly. So it may really help you emotionally figure out what makes you happy and what's fulfilling to you. It's great. It's built in for you, Esther. You sell the house. You both get your piece of the house, of the sale. Mm -hmm. And then you say, like, let's just take a beat. And you ask for a temporary separation. And you demand that he goes to therapy on his own. Oh, he's already doing that. Okay. And then you go on your own because this is also you, Esther. This is you solving this old historical men are the leaders, women are submissive. That's what you need to go get somebody to support you and help you define your own confidence and your own way and really give you a voice. And so when you have that separation and you're not under the same roof, you can think clearly. So you're not going to say, let's get a divorce. It's just, let's use that time. I need some space so that I can get some clarity from this. And you have some work to do too on your own. And then we will come together in 90 days and we'll sit down for coffee and we'll talk about what we've learned about ourselves. And then we'll go from there. Like, don't worry, get a month to month lease on something. Just yeah. get under your own roof because you haven't had enough time before you met him. You were still so young and you weren't on your feet financially yet when you met him. I really feel like you need to feel your success that you have now independently of him to kind of feel that and really just be in your own space. I don't know about you, Anna, but whenever we've lived with somebody and there's been something like this, it's almost impossible to heal and it's almost impossible to stay mad at them because they walk into the kitchen 
and they say something funny and you're like, oh, you're cute. And then the next thing you know, you're right back at it. Like, it's really hard. And Esther, I know that you had mentioned that you guys were trying to conceive. So this was a particularly, let's say, like emotionally loaded time in a fragile relationship. So as like you kind of take away the advice and the food for thought that April has given you, my word of caution would be a pregnancy is a beautiful time in a strong relationship. It is a really hard and vulnerable time, though. And if you want to raise your baby with a partner, you want somebody who's really there for you that you can count on because, you know, you don't feel awesome about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> can only imagine. <laughs> and it is a weirdly long time. <laughs> Um, so I know that that, that maybe taking a pause on that is kind of heartbreaking because I know that you guys have been futurizing and I don't want to take those thoughts away from you at all. I want you to have as many babies as you want (laughs) and they will be gorgeous because you're gorgeous. Don't let the age thing stress you out. I was 35 when I first tried to get pregnant and it worked. And I do believe that even if he didn't sleep with her, like April said, there is definitely a form of betrayal here. And it certainly doesn't make you think like, oh, well, he won't sleep with her. And also, April and I have the luxury of a little bit of time and a distance with all of this. But there's a reason why we're not obsessing about her or even much about him. We already kind of know that's where the age part comes in, (laughs) that unless he does radical transformation, this relationship will be hard. I really don't like it that he said the controlling thing, the I'll sleep in the car thing. That's definitely behavior that you can't change. And from my experience, it's very, very difficult for people to recognize that in themselves because those types of people also very much believe it. The highly manipulative people almost don't know it. Because it's like they're so self-absorbed in their narcissism and their shit that they just throw it back out there without really taking your heart into consideration the way they should. Yeah, love isn't self-preservation, right? (laughs) Yeah, and it's not up to you to be 70% of the relationship. I do believe that his own thoughts and his own torment, whatever's going on with him, is too consuming for him to get out of and you can't bring him out of that either that's interesting that you mentioned that because through all this i feel like every time i want to decide to do something every time i think about you know what's the next step for me for separation because i know that needs to happen i think about him what is he gonna do i don't want him to sleep in the car i don't want him to be sad all the time i don't want so all i think is you know how uncomfortable how hard it's gonna be on him Esther, unfortunately, they survived. (laughs) I was like, who's going to make a dentist appointment for him? Yeah, that's me. I do everything for him pretty much. And I don't mind, but it's like Mm -hmm. I do our finances together. So we have our bank accounts together. I pay the bills. I do all the, you know, housekeeping stuff. And so for me, it's like he doesn't even do his own laundry. (laughs) Well, good thing his parents are two doors down. (laughs) What does he bring to the relationship? What are his skill sets within the marriage? I don't know if I know how to answer that. Really? (laughs) He's very kind. I got to say he's, well, before this happened, I felt that he did put me first. And he's always, you know, checking with me. What do you want to do? I'll do whatever you want to do. Let's go and do this. Um, He actually mentioned to go counseling together um, before this whole thing happened, just to better our relationship, communication. He felt like we weren't having good communication. But I don't know. I can't not put it into words, but he made me feel good. He made me feel safe. I don't worry about anything when I'm with him. I just, I'm just here with him and I'm content, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, well, you also haven't spent a lot of time on your own. I mean, th- that's nice that on that one day a week, he's like, what would you like to do? But I, <laughs> Anna's heard me say this before on the podcast, which is like, my friend used to say, that's like patting the tenor on the back for clearing his throat before he sings the aria. You know, it's like, it's a given that somebody, your partner comes home and says, hey, what do you want to do on Sunday? It just seems like you do the brunt of everything. And what does forgiveness look like? Forgiveness is in the mind and the heart. Forgiveness is not in an action. 
there's something else, right? And why are we forgiving someone just because they asked us to forgive? Or, you know, there's so many things that you have to do. But know this, when you worry about him and you think, well, I don't want to put him out. In effect, what you're doing is you're taking away his journey to figuring that stuff out, to becoming a real man. Because I think that whatever this is, this emotional affair, which by the way is almost worse than a physical one, is also a way of showing you that he's not 100% ready for deep intimacy and commitment. Because if it was happening during a time of trying to conceive a child, which is the extension of your relationship, he chose to divert his energy and attention to someone else. That tells me that there's a little bit of immaturity there. There's a little bit of lack of readiness and that's what he has to look at. That has nothing to do with you. And that's the right. scary part. If you're going to carry a baby in your body, don't you want somebody who's a grown-up who isn't going to run every time the wind blows Definitely. or the kid gets sick or, you know, you lose your job? You know, it's like, because otherwise there's always a reason, you know? So it's not about like, can we put this marriage back on track? You have to figure out what do you expect? You guys are missing a lot. And I think it's because you're working two jobs. You see each other basically one day a week. The rest of the time, it's just like hit the sack and go to bed at night. You guys are like ships passing in the night. And I don't know how old he was when he met you. 25. Okay. I mean, come on. So when people get together under 30, and Anna said this last time, if I could tell my son. If I could enforce the idea of my son not getting married until he was 30, I would. <laughs> because when you get married in your 20s, you're getting married before you've actually completed your story. You're getting married before you make money, before you have the career you're supposed to have, before you're, I call it like the fully developed story. And so you short circuit development and then everybody's like, oh, I'm my marriage is falling apart, we're cheating. But it's really because those two got married too young. So he's still in growth mode. Yeah, he only dated this other girl before me, the girl that keeps going back to. I told him, I don't care about her but you keep going back. So there's something, right? So she has been trying to get in our entire relationship, but he's giving her the power, right? So I told him, it's not about her. I don't care about her. Um, she's seven years younger than me. She's a kid. <laughs> he's talking to a 22-year-old. What does that tell you? There's immaturity. Her lifestyle, it's completely opposite than mine. It's masculine. I was like, is that why? Esther. Oh, Esther. This is part of the hamster wheel. Yep. Yeah. I used to think the same thing. If you can just really avoid comparison, you can't solve anything and it's detrimental to your spirit. She's right, Esther, but it also has very much to do with you. And here's why. It's more common that when men get married and they get married too young or they're lacking self-confidence or maturity, they cheat down because with the person who is younger less evolved, less uh, successful, less educated, they get to feel very empowered and powerful. Oh my God, you're so right. Because that girl <laughs> is looking up at him with big eyes and like, wow, he's older, he's experienced. You're a partner. You are a sophisticated, shoulder-to-shoulder, -shoulder, highly educated. You are grounded. You are mature. And then when you're talking to him and you're like, but you chose her, da-da-da-da, you sound very mom you sound like the mother teaching her son the rules of the world. And that's not where you want to be as a female in a marriage. It's off balance. So he didn't look to a sophisticated, highly educated, successful woman who makes more money than you, who has more degrees behind her name. He went down. I have to tell you a memory, guys. Yeah. I remember one time in a heated argument during my first divorce, I said to him, mommy's gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, that's kind of how I feel. But, you know, no matter what you sort of land on and what the next year looks like for you, I just want you to seek joy in yourself, gravitate to things that are rewarding. And I don't think you should ever look at life as like you've invested seven to 10 years already. So therefore, you must invest the rest of your life. You don't know what anybody that time. This is yours. So, Esther, thank you so much for opening up with us. And I don't know if everything we've said today is easy, but we have your back and we care about you. We really appreciate this. <laughs> what an honor. 
You're going to land on your feet, Esther. Trust yourself. Get into your heart and your vulnerability so that you can find your voice and you can find your strength. And make sure when you're in process that you only get on the phone or see people in person who back you and celebrate your independent decisions. Because what you need right now is consistency in a community that really cheers you on. So seek that out and that will give you a lot of help. Thank you so much. It's really helped bring some clarity to yeah, to this. <laughs> you're amazing, Esther. Yeah, you're amazing. You're going to tackle life. I hope so. Truly, you are so strong. Mm -hmm. You're really, really incredible. You're going to be great. Thank you. Thanks, Esther. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, Esther. Bye. Bye.